In the words of the Smashing Pumpkins, time is never time at all. Designers Maxime Rambourg and Theo Rivière are putting this theory to the test in today's game, The Loop, our provided review copy coming to us from Pandasaurus Games. This cooperative title puts you and up to three more of your friends into the phone booth trying to stop Dr. Foe from enacting his nefarious schemes and destroying the timelines. If you're at all a fan of table presence in games, I promise you this is one you've been waiting for. Let's open it up and see if Bruce Willis and CGI Joseph Gordon Levitt are inside. Past our mustachioed villain on the cover, we're going to find, well, nothing to write home about. And certainly no Emily Blunt protecting a child of questionable powers. Three quote unquote rule books start us off, the larger of which is the actual rule book. The smaller one guides you through the player characters and objective setups, and the last one page sheet advises you on how to play our game solo. Those aside, everything else is hodgepodge tossed into our box. Clone token bag, game board, vortex tokens, and mission tiles. Sometimes the cards have bags, sometimes they don't. For reasons I'm going to get into in a minute, this game really deserves some better attention to storage, even if the inside of the box is replete with some more of Simon Caruso's outstanding visual strokes. Let's uh, set aside this sadness and ride our DeLorean to a better reality, shall we? In our demo game here, we have Mr. Time, the Time Prowler, and Robo Finisher 404 squaring off against Dr. Foe in the Sabotage game mode, recommended for your first game. Each of the game's modes have variable difficulty settings, so you can scale each of them to your group. The object of your lap around our temporal play fields is to complete four of the seven randomly chosen missions. Do so before a second vortex is placed in any of the six eras, a fourth vortex would be placed anywhere on the board, thus preventing you from accomplishing the aforementioned four missions, or running out of time in the game's three cycles, and H.G. Wells himself shows up on your doorstep to congratulate you. I mean, not really, but you get the idea. Completing said missions, however, while simultaneously avoiding and dispatching Dr. Foe's clones can be as difficult as preventing a paradox. Let me be your guide. Each player turn has five phases. The first thing you'll do every turn is reveal what Dr. Foe has been up to. You'll reveal clone tokens out of the bag equal to the number shown on the HQ board here, and then place each token on the era specified on the back. Green is green. Make sure you're placing the tokens face up, as that's the side that reveals the era needed to eliminate that particular clone. If you need to reveal an artifact, again referring to the HQ board, then you will flip the top card from the deck face up and place it in the era specified on the card. Once that's done, reveal the top card from the foe deck to see where the eponymous doctor has traveled. You'll point the center spout of the machine to that era, like so, and then activate it. Take two cubes and then add more equal to the number of clones in the area designated, in this case zero, and drop them all into the chute. The machine will then spit them out into one of the three areas, creating rifts in each of those times. Place the cubes in the rift slots on the era and hope you can, cause if you can't, now we're in Vortex Town. If there are already too many rift cubes in an era such that no more could fit, the rift has opened its maw too wide and swallowed up that time. Replace the mission tile with a vortex, and now not only can you no longer complete that mission, but you need to protect this era further from incursion. Filling up the rift cubes again to the point that another vortex would spawn ends your journey faster than Eric Bana shooting himself in the past before Rachel McAdams can get to him. Also, spoilers. Sorry. Now that you've determined just what Dr. Foe has done, it's time to do some damage yourself. There are three actions available to you, and you can do them as many times as you'd like and or have the resources to. First off, you'll likely want to reposition yourself in the timeline. To do so, spend an energy cube hidden in your era and slingshot yourself to a nearby one. You can also use an artifact in your hand, which is slightly misleading since your hand is actually a tableau in front of you. Turn one of your ready artifacts sideways and then use its power for great justice. Finally, you can loop. 
Looping is one of the most powerful abilities in the game, and it requires some finesse to make it work. You need energy in your era to power your anachrony, and by spending that energy, you can ready any cards in your hand with the same icon on them. Only one icon can be chosen per loop ability, and while you can loop twice in the same turn, the second loop is going to cost two energy cubes, the third three, and so on. So, as my uncle always taught me, loop wisely. Eliminating the clones is as easy as pushing them into an era that matches the icon on their face, as denoted in the monocle. This causes a paradox, and they'll turn into gooey piles of flesh and teeth. Bonus points if you got that reference. Once you're done with your actions, you can take an artifact from the era that you stopped in and placing it face down on the top of your draw pile. Remember, choose wisely here, because not only are you going to definitely draw that artifact next, but you're also pushing the other artifacts in your pile further away. Completing missions is the only way to win the game and avoid future Biff's Casino timeline. You can only complete a mission on your turn if you're in the era at the end and if the progress on the given mission is complete. Move it away from being vortexed and then reveal the mission in Dr. Foe's era. If that one's already revealed, move clockwise around the board until you find one that isn't and reveal that one. Passing the turn to the next player is a matter of discarding your artifacts, drawing back up to three in front of you, and then checking the foe deck to see if a new cycle begins. Around and around you'll go like this until either great success or the more likely horrible failure. So, let's talk about how all this works. A caveat right up front, I don't generally like co-op games, especially ones without hidden information. They suffer from quarterbacking pretty easily, and they're almost always single-player affairs in disguise. The loop doesn't avoid this fate, but there's also enough going on here to keep my interest. Before I get into that, let's talk about how it doesn't. Learning to play the loop is just a single click too far into the complicated area. While it's certainly not the most complicated game you can play by far, it just has one too many moving pieces for me. I get that there needs to be an in-game timer, and that using eras to determine when a new cycle starts prevents the pandemic-style too-many-too-fast endgame. It just didn't feel elegant or inventive to me. When your game is all about time travel and clones, having a standard flip through this deck until empty and then repeat wasn't what I wanted. You may also find yourself really grinding the game to a halt as you try to feel out the best path to take through your available actions. And since looping opens up even more, you can spend literally 10 minutes just thinking about a turn rather than actually playing. One additional element that didn't resonate was the fact that there's really a lot to fight against. These clones will quickly overwhelm you by forcing too many cubes into the machine, which in turn will spawn vortexes too quickly. Preventing this mostly requires you to use your artifacts, but getting new artifacts prevents you from using the ones you have reliably, and so on and so on. Coordinating energy into eras where you need it so you can push clones around to prevent the mission you're almost done with from being lost can feel great when it works, but when you fail to get just the right pieces together, it can feel absolutely miserable and heartbreaking. Some missions can have progress cubes added to them multiple times in a turn, and that also feels great, but doing that and then getting back to, into that era to complete it isn't always guaranteed. Now, these are, admittedly, mostly problems that some people who really love co-op games would point to as selling features. The game's not imminently winnable. Strategy is almost always better than tactics. I want a co-op game to feel challenging, etc. And I can't disagree. There's stuff that the loop does really well. I love the fact that there's four different game modes and that the player characters are asymmetrical. Asymmetry in games is like a giant neon sign saying, Nicholas, look here, and the balance really sings in loop. New players can play a simple character that doesn't require a ton of finesse, while advanced or seasoned players can take on V-Girl herself and do some great turns. Overall, I do like the loop a lot. There's plenty of thematic time travel shenanigans going on, and it can be a delightful challenge to suss out the best turn you can make, as long as you're not shutting down the game to do it. If you love the theme, then the art is a huge selling feature, and while this machine can be a little bit small for players with bigger hands, it looks great on the table and works pretty well as a randomizer. There's so much to like about this game on the table. It's probably just me that wanted the game itself to get out of the way just a tiny bit more. 
The Loop brings a fresh take to the cooperative board game genre, and while it still might suffer from quarterbacking, as I've mentioned, that shouldn't dissuade you. Let's go through our checklist before I give you my final thoughts. In the box, rulebook clear and non-gender pronouns. Loop's rulebook, despite being large and a little unwieldy on the table, works well to guide you through setup and making each step of your action phase clear. There are tons of provided examples, and any edge cases we found during our plays were covered in there. Additionally, the operational booklet separating out character info and the individual missions in-game is very handy so as not to need constant checking in with the larger book. Both of them use the second person, you, to denote the player. Iconography clear. Helpfully, each of the game's ages are marked by both color and icons, so colorblind players need not worry. The larger rulebook has a key for the rest of the game's ability icons, which shouldn't take long to have down pat. Packaging well done. Alas, not really. Pandasaurus has provided nothing in the way of organization for the game's box, and even more disappointingly, did not provide enough baggies for the components. Mission tiles and vortices, vor vortexes? Float around the box aimlessly, and the folded up board is significantly smaller than the inside of the box, allowing it too to bang around in there. Given the elven gameplay here, it's certainly disappointing to see such little attention was paid to organization. On the table. Good representation. Of the five playable characters in-game, two of them are women, one is a she-her robot, and one is a not-quite-elder god. A great mix of characters here. All of the enemies you'll face are clones of the good Dr. Foe himself. Component quality. The chunky wooden player tokens are absolutely outstanding on the table. Dr. Foe's machine slash cube tower is a very cool, if slightly too small way to randomize token dispersal, and everything else is perfectly serviceable standard punch and cards. Replay value, very high. With five individual characters, each with their own player powers and four individual objectives, setup is going to be plenty variable through your first handful of plays. Add on to that the 10 mission tiles, seven of which make up a game, and you've got a schematic for tons to do. Fun to lose. This can depend. Games can end fairly quickly with poor luck, especially if you're using the Mega Vortices, but overall you can plan around any sudden death situations. None of our planning games felt too drudgy or defeatist, but if you have a low stomach for the way cooperative games make you feel like you're always on the verge of losing, then this one won't do anything to ease that pain. The Loop is a great entry into the cooperative board game field, a genre that I don't tend to like for reasons I've stated earlier. This one challenges that aversion, though, as the visual appeal and modifiable rule set are delightful and I love the theme. As always, I'm Nicholas, reminding you to help protect the game population. Always leave your cards. <laughs>